uh, thank you to the dean. I didn't know he was going to say that about the RBG stuff, but um, the nightgown that I have here in my hotel across the street is actually a uh, notorious RBG nightgown. So um, there you go. Um, so I want to thank uh, Case Western for inviting me and for to Professor Hill, who's been an amazingly generous host. So thank you. Um, Professor Hill encouraged me to speak about the opioid crisis today in my remarks because it's something we've been focusing on uh, at Yale. I'm going to do that today, but I want to just begin by explaining why that's a little bit daunting um, for at least three reasons and probably more. The first is that the crisis is so very complex. It's been caused by multiple intersecting factors. It has to be resolved by a variety of intersecting solutions. There's no magic bullet, and we know that law alone cannot be the solution. Any legal solution itself also has to be multifaceted. The second reason is that I'm a relative newcomer um, to this topic. As the dean mentioned, I run our Health Law and Policy Center at Yale. And about a year ago, there was a groundswell of interest across Yale University in the crisis. Doctors, economists, students, law students, law faculty were calling us saying, how can we engage in the crisis? So what we did this fall is that we held a first of its kind interdisciplinary seminar. We brought together faculty and students from across the university, basically a crash course where everybody contributed their knowledge, mental health, health law, FDA, litigation, criminal law. It was quite overwhelming, uh, but really amazingly educational. And the result is that we're putting out a journal volume in the Journal of Law, Medicine, and Ethics this summer that talks about the role of law across these interdisciplinary perspectives. So what I'm hoping to do today is just to offer you a snapshot of that, the different ways in which law has intersected across all these disciplines with the crisis. Um, but please know that every time I read something or learn something, I realize how much more there is to know and that I can't possibly cover everything we did in 30 minutes. So I'm just going to try to hit the points that are the most interesting from a legal perspective and also the most accessible in this kind of format. Um, third, I also just want to say that it's daunting and humbling to come and speak about the crisis here in Ohio, the state that's been hit so hard by it. I'm sure there are people in this room that know people who have been personally affected or maybe people in this room who have been personally affected. And it's a difficult topic. Um, and given the personal toll the crisis has taken, sometimes it feels awkward to talk about law because law can be abstract and impersonal, even though law aims to try to help. Uh, so please don't take the legal nature of my comments to at all underappreciate the enormous hum human toll that the crisis has taken. Um, so with that, there are a lot of ways that law intersects with the opioid crisis. Law in the courts, litigation, is a very important one and one that has its home base right here in Ohio. I'm going to talk about that, but at the end of the talk, because that's what I'm writing about now and I spend a lot of time on, I want to start with some less obvious ways uh, that law has been a major player in the opioid ec epidemic. And throughout that, this, I'm going to talk about ways in which law has been a help and in which ways law has been a cause and an obstacle of the problems that we faced. So I'm going to begin with the medical profession, because uh, that's another area that I focus on. We all know that doctors have had a major role in this crisis through an epidemic of overprescribing. Uh, now, having helped to cause the crisis, doctors are overwhelmed and under-resourced to have to help with the solution, helping those who have been harmed. But it's important to see that both law and medical regulation have contributed significant structural incentives that caused this situation to occur. And I wanted to spend a few minutes explaining this. So pain, as many of you know, has been a historically undertreated area of medicine. Proper treatment of pain is essential to healing. It's essential to surgical and other important modern medical techniques. Pain wasn't recognized as a medical specialty until the 1990s. Uh, in that decade, in response to the pervasive undertreatment of pain, there led to several developments to address that undertreatment that in hindsight probably contributed to the crisis. Congress, the Veterans Health Administration, and the medical profession started paying more attention to pain during that time. The medical specialty was born. Following on these developments, the Joint Commission, an enormously influential hospital accreditation agency, published new pain standards. As part of those standards, it asked every doctor to ask about pain in the patient encounter. If any of you have been asked the question, rate your pain on a scale of 1 to 10, that's where it came from. Okay, most critically, the Joint Commission standards are also tied to reimbursement. This is where law and regulation come in. A hospital's reimbursement under Medicare and Medicaid depends in part on its compliance with the Joint Commission standards. So as part of this reform, there were customer satisfaction surveys that were also promulgated. Customers were asked to rate their patient experience, including their experience with pain. 
Doctors knew patients were filling out these surveys. They knew reimbursement was going to be tied to these surveys. And most physicians now focusing on this field recognize that this created a storm of overprescribing by sort of skewing incentives. Of course, I have to mention during this era that pharmaceutical companies were also very aggressively promoting uh, opioids as non-addictive or less addictive and safe to doctors. And this all together created this perfect storm of prescribing that not only affected the new specialty, but more importantly, primary care. So pain medicines were advertised to primary care doctors who still get almost no treatment in medical school on pain management as a quick and safe way to help patients. Opioids are covered by insurance. Many other uh, ways to treat pain are not, psychosocial interventions, physical therapy. For primary care doctors who have very short patient encounters, who are underpaid as it is, who've had patients with often not the most robust insurance, you can see how opioids were touted as a cheap and easy way to address this problem. On the back end now, primary care doctors are again being forced or asked to shoulder the burden. More than half of cases for pain treatment and addiction still occur in the primary care context. Addiction itself was only recognized as a medical specialty last year. There are similar problems on the addiction side. Um, addiction medicine isn't taught in medical school curriculum, but there are other legal barriers too, and I want to mention the most significant. First, as a vestige of earlier efforts to address the war on drugs, there's a statute on the books that requires that methadone, one of the most effective treatments for addiction, occur in separate special clinics. There is a stigma for some doctors to operate these clinics, a stigma for some patients to attend them. So methadone is not easily accessible because of these old laws. There are newer medications that also work. One of them is buprenorphine. Here also, federal law interferes. Federal law limits the doctors in any one area who can prescribe this drug and requires doctors to take courses of eight hours before they're allowed to prescribe it. There is no other drug that has imposed this kind of regulation on doctors. So it has disincentivized doctors to provide this therapy. Let me sort of point out the big irony here. There is no training required and no limitations required on who can prescribe opioids, but there are huge impediments to doctors when they want to treat. Now, for those not deeply in crisis, involved in the crisis, one thing that may not be obvious is just how important these medication-assisted treatments are. Medication-assisted treatment, otherwise known as MAT, uh, are long-acting medications that offer slow release of dopamine to help patients refrain from illicit opioid use without the physical consequences of opioid use and without the euphoria that comes with opioid use. Evidence has shown this is the most effective way to treat opioid use disorder or addiction. But MAT is not equally accessible to everyone everywhere. That's a law problem, too, because it's a social justice problem. It's an unequal access problem. For, existence, for example, every state's Medicaid program covers some aspect of MAT, but not every state has expanded Medicaid under the Affordable Care Act. So in many states, there are people without insurance who don't have access to MAT. MAT is also less available in rural areas, again, because it's so hard for doctors to, to offer it. Ohio, as you may know, has expanded Medicaid, but I heard from a doctor in our seminar that many methadone clinics, in Cincinnati at least, don't accept Medicaid. Uh, if that's true, uh, it's, a, it's a problem. Um, MAT is also hardly available in prisons, even though prisons are filled with people who have opioid use disorder. This might actually be a constitutional problem because the Constitution requires the standard of medical care be available inside prisons. Rhode Island is now the only state in the nation to, by law, require MAT be available inside every prison facility. Um, one article in the volume we're producing suggests this is a violation of the Eighth Amendment of the Constitution, which prevents cruel and unusual punishment. And that is because it is a violation of the Eighth Amendment to deny needed medical care for other diseases. Ohio does not offer a right to MAT in prison. I have read that Cincinnati is experimenting with a, uh, a, a, less, uh, a less favored but still better than nothing standard of care, which is a drug called Vivitrol, uh, which is given uh, to patients right before they get out. It blocks the effects of opioid and heroin for four weeks. So it's sort of, it's a, it's sort of an envelope that happens on your way out of prison, but it's not the standard of care for treating addiction. I should also mention that detoxification has been shown to be less effective and also dangerous, and I can explain why people are curious. So let me briefly reference one other legal impediment to effective treatment of this disease by doctors. There's a federal law regulation on the books that protects patients' private health information if they're being treated for addiction. You can see why this law has the best of intentions, to protect patient privacy, to prevent stigma. 
But what happens is doctors who are asked to treat patients for pain, they cannot see from the medical record if the patient is also being treated for addiction. So doctors may be unknowingly prescribing more opioids to those who are already suffering from addiction. Now, turning more directly to the role that doctors have played in the crisis, there have been many efforts to address it. First, the Joint Commission is revising pain standards. There have also been prosecutions of doctors criminally and for medical malpractice. And in the pain specialty, experts are working to change the standard of care to normalize some pain. We Americans expect to have a pain-free experience, but studies actually show that being overtreated for pain makes you less tolerant of it. There's also been a significant legislative response to doctors' actions. Many states have put laws on the books prohibiting certain amounts of opioids to be prescribed for more than a certain number of days, to require doctors to track databases, to require doctors to give certain warnings. And there's evidence that these other efforts are helping. Prescribing is already way down. But at the same time, there are some concerns with this kind of regulation of physicians. First, there is now suddenly a growing concern that we are undertreating pain again. There are patients with chronic conditions that can no longer access the drugs that they need. Keep in mind, too, that minority public populations have historically suffered from low rates of, of treatment. For example, earlier in the epidemic, black and Latino populations appeared to be affected less by the crisis than in earlier drug epidemics. One explanation commonly offered was almost perversely protective. The argument was, well, since blacks and minorities have been discriminated by doctors who take their complaints of pain less seriously, and they're also underinsured, they've been effectively protected from this epidemic. And we can all see that these argue, those kinds of arguments are problematic for all sorts of reasons. But if we return to an era of undertreatment, those populations are likely to be undertreated again, and even more so. Second, from a basic health law perspective, even though some of you may feel these regulations are warranted given physicians' role in the crisis, it's important to emphasize that there is no other class of drugs that has this much regulation on doctors. Once approved by the FDA, as opioids are, doctors are allowed to prescribe any drug for any purpose, even those purposes not already approved by the FDA. They don't have to give warnings. They don't have to have training. They don't have to administer drugs in special places. There are no, to, to, just to set, uh, make clear the deviation from the norm, the only other areas of the law in which doctors have been regulated this way are enormously politicized areas like abortion. Laws saying that doctors have to show people pictures, the sonograms of the fetus before an abortion, or gun laws. Um, so for the medical profession, many doctors feel this is a real deviation from decades-long tradition of respecting physician autonomy to treat patients on an individual basis. And some doctors feel they can no longer treat patients as they think they can be treated. Ohio does regulate, I should say, some of those laws restricting physician speech and behavior in the abortion context and the gun context has been challenged on constitutional grounds. Ohio does regulate doctors extensively in this way. Among many other laws, it requires a maximum of seven-day supply for the first prescription, uh, mandatory warnings for minors, mandatory checkings of the prescription drug, drug database, and much more. <coughs> so I'm going to move away now from this point to talk now about the criminal side, which is not my particular area of expertise, but which can't be ignored. One thing that's important to remember is that the crisis is now in sort of a second phase, whereas the first phase was about prescriptions and diversion. The second phase uh, has fed this growth of a black market for opioids. One of these is a very powerful and dangerous drug, an illicit opioid called fentanyl. It's sold on the street. It's often synthesized in China, and it is extremely dangerous. It can be lethal in a single dose. It's a very scary drug. Um, this drug trafficking market obviously creates very different and important challenges for criminal law enforcement than merely going after prescription and diversion. Getting at this trafficking crime has to be more of a priority for our drug enforcement agencies. Some critics say the federal government has not done enough. But on the other spectrum, on the criminal side, there's also been a much softer side to law enforcement. The U.S. attorney's offices across the country are actually focusing a lot more on education and community involvement. The chief opioid prosecutor in Connecticut has openly made speeches saying that arrests cannot solve this problem, and he has devoted his resources to um, education. But all of these efforts, soft and not soft, have to be combined with serious drug trafficking efforts. There's one other aspect of the criminal context that deserves mention. There are a growing number of people, including President Ernesto Zedillo, the former president of Mexico, who now teaches at Yale and was part of our conversation this fall, who have started to talk openly about how our system of criminalization of drugs may have contributed to the crisis. President Zedillo and other economists have emphasized that criminalization of drugs has created a black market that has fed the epidemic and made it more dangerous. For instance, pushing people to access fentanyl because it's cheaper and more powerful because they can't get a regular prescription of OxyContin without going to the doctor. 
Obviously, this is a very provocative argument. I myself have preserved judgment on it. But the argument is that open access to more drugs will make us all safer and less an addiction. It's intriguing. It's gaining traction in the international community. And it has to be mentioned in any context of this crisis. The other aspect of this decriminalization argument is that those who promote it want to treat drug use as a public health condition to be regulated and managed, not as a condition of criminal law. And in this sense, we see a dovetailing with the softer approach of the US Attorney's Office. The reason I want to emphasize this is that there's been an enormous shift in the way we talk about this crisis, from one of drug use and criminalization to a public health problem. And that changes the way the criminal justice system is going to intersect with people affected by it. But here I have to pause, and I have to return to the topic that I mentioned earlier, which are racial and ethnic disparities to the crisis because it ties into the rather novel way in this, which this drug crisis is being treated as a public health program, problem. I've already mentioned how minority communities have experienced less of the force of the epidemic, in some part because of the discrimination they suffered at the hands of implicit bias of the medical profession and also in their historic underinsurance, which have combined to give them less access to opioids, sometimes at great medical cost. In recent months, those numbers are closing. There are now indeed minority communities that have been affected as much as white communities by the crisis, and other populations also suffer. As I mentioned, rural populations have much less access to MAC, uh, and even though rural populations are often hit very hard, Indian tribes are also an overlooked area of the crisis. They've been hit very hard. Some of them are suing companies for the harm that they've suffered. The reason I'm pausing on this issue here is that for these minority populations, there's a different kind of harm that the crisis has produced, and it's an expressive harm, to use a lawyer's phrase. For Indian nations, we had the uh, Deputy Attorney General of the Cherokee Nation at Yale last week. For Indian nations, there has been a feeling of being ignored or unimportant. The harm that Indian nations have suffered is rarely mentioned in the media. It's rarely given the same attention as other coverage. For black populations, the issue is not only a lack of media attention, but also all the attention to white suffering. And in particular, a resentment has developed because of the view that the reason this crisis is being treated differently as a public health program problem and not as a drug or a criminal law problem is that the people who are being affected are upper middle class white people. Black communities point to the very different approach of the drug crisis of the 1970s and 80s, which, prompt, which predominantly did affect black communities and were treated with excessive criminalization, including, for example, notorious rock, New York's notorious Rockefeller drug laws. Black communities feel that white addicts are getting a different standard of treatment, a softer and more caring standard of treatment because of who they are. With that, I'm going to move into two different and final areas of the talk because they tie into the nature of the aggressive and unique response of the crisis. Uh, the, that is the response generated in the state houses and in the courts. I'm going to spend the most time on the courts because that's what I'm writing about, but I'm first going to mention the state houses because they're important. The states have been very active in passing legislation in addition to all the kinds of doctor regulation I've already described. All 50 states have prescription drug monitoring programs. These are state databases. There's nothing like this at the federal level. They allow doctors and pharmacies to quickly check the history, the medication history of the patient for whom they're prescribing. All 50 states cover some MAT in their Medicaid programs, but as I said, not every state is fully expanded Medicaid, and most states don't cover all the different kinds of MAT. There are at least three, and not every kind is proper for each patient. All 50 states have passed laws uh, allowing access to naloxone, which is a medication designed to rapidly reduce overdoses. Before these state laws were passed, you could be arrested for possessing naloxone or administering it without a prescription. 41 states have syringe exchange programs, which limit the spread of infection, which is a serious re risk for intravenous drug users. Uh, Ohio has that. 40 states have passed Good Samaritan laws, including Ohio. These are laws that provide immunity from criminal action if you call 911 while someone is overdosing. These are all important efforts, and there are many more that I haven't mentioned, such as state legislated education programs and some criminal justice and sentencing reforms, too. They're to be applauded, and there likely will be some very positive contributions from these efforts. But one thing to take note of is to see how much stuff right, states are throwing at the crisis. States are trying to hit the crisis from every angle. That's a good thing, but resources are not infinite, and we need some data on what works. Law professors love to talk about the states as laboratories of experimentation. That's a famous quote from Justice Brandeis, who was uh, praising our federalist system for having 50 different labs of experimentation across the country. Remember. The Affordable Care Act itself came out of a state experiment from the state of Massachusetts. States are good experimenters, but as many people have chronicled, states are also very bad data collectors. States rarely track 
the results of their experiments in a scientific way so that we can actually apply them in a, in a thoughtful way across the country. That makes them good experimenters, but maybe not the best policy laboratories. One paper in our volume chronicles a variety of responses out of Kentucky, for example. In those responses, um, high, uh, high acting officials were interviewed, and they said, yes, these are working, numbers are going down. But when asked to identify which of the many responses were working most, they said, we don't know because we don't have the people or the resources to put in robust systems to collect data and figure out which responses work best. And quite frankly, we were told, we don't have time. This is a crisis. We don't have time to independently test each possible response. We have to help our people right now. That is obviously a, re a reasonable response, but at the same time, more data is needed. As a different example, in our seminar, we were fortunate to have a well-known economist who's on the Yale Law School faculty, Ian Ayers, was interested in this question of states tracking data. He decided to pick one area that he could test with his economic modeling, and that is the use of these prescription drug, prescription drug monitoring databases. He was able to use his economic tools to determine that only those laws that require physicians to look in the databases are worth preserving. The ones that are optional aren't doing very much, and all the other policy debates about how often they have to be updated and stuff were much less relevant than the, than the primary on-off switch between whether the prescription drug monitoring databases were optional or mandatory. That's very useful information that can be used in other kinds of policy reform contexts, and if there was more tracking like that, we might be able to make more progress. Incidentally, Ohio does have one of these mandatory uh, prescription drug monitoring databases. So I'm going to move now to the final section of the talk, which is the most conventionally legal piece of it, and that is the one that has received maybe the most public attention. That's the civil litigation piece. More than 300 lawsuits have already been filed by states, localities, and Indian tribes seeking recovery from an enormous array of actors. The lawsuits are a fascinating development, and Ohio is at the very center of the action. Because as of a few months ago, all of these cases have been consolidated before a single federal judge, Judge Dan Polster, who sits right here in Cleveland. Before I get there to Judge Polster's courtroom, which is the climax of the story, I want to provide some background about the role that litigation is playing. So first, who sued? At the last count, it was 19 states, including Ohio, more than 150 cities and localities, including in Ohio, Indian tribes and individuals. In addition, 41 of the state attorneys generals are actively investigating, although they haven't filed suit yet. Who's suing? This is where things get very interesting. In the suits filed before 2010, which was the, sort of the first wave of the crisis, the main target was Purdue Pharma, the main manufacturer of OxyContin, and doctors. But in the second wave right now, drug manufacturers are still right at the center of the action, and doctors are still being sued. But the focus has shifted, and the net has been cast in a much broader fashion. There are a lot more people as, uh, alleging that more entities are responsible. Um, and the reason this is important, it is one way that litigation is contributing to the conversation about the crisis. Litigation is reframing the debate about who caused this crisis and what their ongoing responsibilities are. Two examples. Drug distributors have been charged. So have pharmacies, like CVS. They've been charged with failing to see red flags in the drugs that they're delivering or dispensing. Too many prescriptions going to the same place or the same person. Some of these cases have already resulted in settlements. And while distributors and pharmacies might not have thought before that it was their role to be gatekeepers, to be monitors, these settlements have changed the way they are thinking about their responsibilities going forward and are likely to change behavior. Other novel defendants have included the Joint Commission, that hospital accreditation agency that promulgated those standards bringing pain into every patient encounter. Again, there you can see how litigation is shaping the narrative of blame. At the same time, this long link, of, this long chain of actors involved really complicates the litigation strategy itself. Courts have already expressed concern that liability is going to be difficult to find in any one actor because there are so many intervening actors along the chain. Doctors claim they're duly prescribing drugs approved by FDA. Distributors argue not only manufacturers, but doctors, with the, doctors and individuals with addiction stand between them and the drug. Retail pharmacies are even further down the line. In addition, this complex chain of responsibility differentiates this litigation from the one with which it is most often compared, and that is the litigation against big tobacco that occurred several decades ago. As in the case of opioids, the tobacco litigation involves litigation largely brought by states to address a massive public health crisis. Some of the experience of the tobacco crisis litigation has raised concerns in the opioid context. I'm just going to mention two. 
One is that there's a view that by some that the settlements were way too low and they were not actually directed at the problem of prevention and treatment for tobacco addiction. Others have criticized the lawyers in those cases. The lawyers, as they are in the opioid context, were largely working on a contingent fee basis. They settled, they got huge settlements, uh, some view that they had incentives to settle for that money without really focusing on changing behavior in a productive way. And those concerns certainly exist in the current context. But at the same time, the tobacco cases were a lot simpler. There is not a long chain of actors between the company and the user. Here we have the user, the manufacturer, the FDA, doctors, and a broad distribution chain. With tobacco, we also did not have a product that was approved as safe and effective by the FDA and that has a valid and critical medical use. That all of this complicates the opioid context enormously. Complicating matters further is the fact that the legal basis for some of the claims brought is very novel. I'll give you just one example. Uh, for claims against the distributors and the drug pharmacies, the claims are largely derived from the Controlled Substances Act, which is a federal law. The Controlled Substances Act uh, tells those who interact with controlled substances they have a duty to monitor the flow of those substances. Plaintiffs here are alleging that federal statute gives them the right to sue pharmacies and distributors for falling down on the job. In defense, those companies have said, this is not an individual right. Our right is to the federal government to monitor those drugs. If the federal government, the DEA, doesn't prosecute us, individuals don't have a right to bring these cases in the civil context. One court has already held that that defense has merit. So what now? This brings me at last to the consolidation of the more than 300 cases here in Ohio in the so-called multi-district litigation. We call MDL for short. Multi-district courts are special creations of federal law. They allow cases that have been filed in different courts across the country but that raise the same claims to be brought before one judge for pretrial management. Importantly, cases can be aggregated in MDL that cannot be brought in class action. Health cases and opioid cases are part of those are not good candidates for class actions in general because our U.S. Supreme Court has held that you need a high degree of commonality, common issues of law and fact for class actions. When it comes to healthcare cases, because everybody is harmed in a different way, and everybody comes into the healthcare context with different pre-existing conditions, it's, it's been very hard to find the commonality that the courts require. So it's hard to have aggregate, consolidated litigation. MDLs are an easier way. They're typically used in the public health context. They're being used right now, for example, in the BP oil spill and the NFL concussion cases. The MDL judge does not have the authority to conduct trials for all the cases in front of him. He's only authorized to do everything that happens before trial. But in reality, more than 97% of cases settle in the MDL court without ever returning to their original jurisdiction for trial, and that is very likely to happen in this context. The high rate of settlement is not surprising given that most civil cases settle, but also the fact that the kinds of big MDLs that are consolidated tend to deal with intractable problems with enormous numbers of harmed individuals. Without a way to aggregate fact-finding, without a way to package these cases for resolution, it could take years for cases to get resolved, and defendants are also very reluctant to settle anything if they think more cases are coming. In the law, we like to call this global peace. Defendants want to settle and have global peace, no further cases. This December, the opioid cases were consolidated before Judge Polster in Cleveland, which was a geographical decision made in part by the consolidating panel due to the impact the crisis has had here in Ohio. There are some cases that have not yet been pulled into the MDL, including cases filed in state court and cases the state AGs have not yet filed because those aren't in federal court and they're not really formally within the power of the MDL. But that said, despite the fact that the MDL lacks formal power over state file cases and cases that have not yet been filed, Judge Polster has already ordered all of those parties to come in and negotiate with everybody else. In other words, he's not focusing on formal boundaries. And these actions are a very important sign that his eye is on a complete global settlement and not just resolution of the cases before him. This is what makes what's happening in Ohio so central and so important to the crisis. These features suggest the court is interested in dealing with the crisis in a way that approaches a legislative solution and not a traditional litigation. It's a problem-solving approach, not a courtroom-driven approach. The judge's own public statements have been fascinating on this topic. He announced at the first hearing his intention to resolve this whole thing in the calendar year of 2018. 
right? An extraordinary short time frame for anything, much less this crisis. He said, quote, this is not a traditional MDL, which generally focuses on something unfortunate that's happened to the past, figuring out how it happened, why it happened, who might be responsible, unquote. He called the crisis ongoing, and then he said, now I'm quoting, people aren't interested in figuring out the answer to interesting legal questions like preemption and learned intermediaries or unraveling, compl unraveling complicated conspiracy theories. So my objective is to do something meaningful to abate this crisis and to do it in 2018. What we've got to do is dramatically reduce the number of pills that are out there, make sure the pills that are out there are being used properly. We need a whole lot, some new systems in place. We need some treatment. We don't need, we don't need a lot of briefs and we don't need trials. They're not going to, none of them are, none of them are going to solve what we've got. Wow, right? So large scale MDLs are not unusual in this way. I want to be clear. Large scale MDLs are massive problem solving endeavors. But what is unusual is the frankness of the judge's statements about what his role is in these cases. Really extraordinary words from the presiding judge. He also chided federal and state governments, in his view, for not doing enough and falling down on the job and punting the issue to the courts. He said, unfortunately, courts may not be the best place to resolve this problem, but courts have had to step up. Now, some people are not fans of MDLs or this MDL in particular. Some think they're undemocratic. They're giving judges enormous power to impose what are effectively legislative solutions on a large number of people without the protections of the democratic process or the courtroom process. Others don't like how MDLs, especially those focused on settlement, like this one, paper over real weaknesses in legal claims. Remember all those concerns I mentioned about the long chain of distribution, the long links, or the weakness in some of those legal claims. They might not be as much of a big deal anymore thanks to the MDL because the MDL is gonna smooth all that stuff over in the interest of settling. We're not heading for trial, we're heading for settlement. The individual strengths of the causes of action arguably are not going to matter as much. The judge himself said, now I'm quoting again, in my humble opinion, everyone shares some of the responsibility and no one has done enough to abate it. This includes the manufacturers, the distributors, the pharmacies, the doctors, the federal government, the state government, local governments, hospitals, third party payers, that's insurers, and individuals. Unquote. On the other hand, others praise MDLs, including this one, for providing a path to sol solution of a difficult and intractable crisis. But regardless, it should be clear the MDL is the game changer in this. By consolidating all these cases before a single judge who's ordered the parties to the negotiating table and expects a resolution in just a few months, defendants have an interest in global settlement in one shot. Attorneys involved, including state attorneys general, may be, attacked, may be attracted to early settlement in quick gains, especially because the individual legal claims themselves may not be as strong as one might hope. Settlement in the near future seems quite likely. The only question is whether it will be enough and specifically designed at the right, directed at the light, right places and the right behavior to actually make a difference. If that happens, litigation will have played an enormously important role. If it doesn't, the risk is that an early but ineffective settlement will take the wind out of other more productive sales for change. Regardless, it's clear that litigation has helped set the agenda and raise the profile of the crisis and frame the issues. It already may have prompted change. As just a few examples, Purdue recently announced it was no longer going to directly promote OxyContin to doctors and has cut its detailing force in half. The Joint Commission has revised its paying guidelines. Doctor prescribing numbers are way down. At least some of this has to co have come from the pressure and attention that litigation has focused on this crisis. Some of it obviously also is due to the pressure and attention from the legislative responses. So there's a lot more that I can say here about the role of law in the crisis, but we'll be here all night. Uh, my hope is, was to give you a snapshot of the different ways that law has helped, herped, and framed the crisis. Law alone can't solve a public crisis of this scale, but for lawyers, the hope is that law will be a productive partner in whatever solution comes out. Thanks. Okay, so we have um, about 20 minutes for questions um, from the audience, and then there's a reception following this. Do we have mics back there, or are we just... Is there a traveling microphone or no? Oh, okay. So, you can take the time to think about your question. Formulate. 
Testing one, two. My question is, what sort of remedies are being considered by the court? Right. So um, this is actually a very difficult question. So if you look at the complaints that have been filed, there have been no requests for specific remedies. All that's being asked for is just money, not even specific amounts of money, not specific behavior change modifications, right? So what's concerning is that you've got all these complaints out there. Everyone's asking for money. Money is obviously very important because we have to treat the public health problem that's come out of this. Um, but a lot of people, litigation specialists, are looking at these complaints and saying, What's going to happen? Who's going to figure out exactly how to solve the crisis? And this goes back, this is where it ties back in to the legislative solutions that I had mentioned. There too, there are all these different kinds of responses and I've laid those out. And it's possible that part of the court solution will tie into some of those legislative solutions. But we haven't had any studies saying which one of those 20 various common legislative solutions has actually worked best. So for a lot of people who are following this and who are focusing on how much effort and resources have been put into litigation, people are a little concerned about um, whatever the judge is going to order. Jesse's going to. Hi. Hi. Uh, so my question is, uh, you mentioned earlier that uh, some of the defenses that these companies are raising are that the uh, federal government should be prosecuting. It shouldn't be individuals that are bringing this under the federal statutes. Uh, given that Attorney General Sessions announced today that there's an opioid task force led by the federal government that will be uh, joining these lawsuits and filing statements of interest and in others, do you think that that's enough to overcome those kind of defenses? Um, you know, as they say, the proof is in the pudding. I think that um, more DEA enforcement is, is, is absolutely necessary. Uh, by most accounts, the fentanyl market is extremely hard to track down. The way the shipments are coming in from China has proved to uh, be elusive to criminal enforcement, and so the more resources that are directed, the better. Uh, part of the statements of interest, I think uh, I've been here at Case Western all day giving talks, so I haven't read the press release you're referring to, but part of the reference to the statements of interest actually comes from what Judge Polster is doing. So here in Ohio, um, in the cases before him, I know that there have been requests for information the federal government may have about the role of various actors in the crisis. The people in the civil suits want to get that information from the federal government. There's been some concern on the part of federal prosecutors about divulging confidential information. And I believe Judge Polster has called the parties to his courtroom to discuss these issues. So my guess is that part of the reason the DEA is going to be filing a statement of interest is to address those very problems. But again, this is a national issue of national importance. They can't just stay out of Judge Polster's courtroom. If the main settlement's going to come here in the civil context, they have to be involved in these cases. Um, so in the first question that you answered, you talked about how they're just asking for money, right? There is no specific remedy. Um, in the context of this settlement, uh, how exactly is, do, you, do you suspect that you have the knowledge to be able to determine how Judge Holster, is that what his name is? Holster. How Judge Holster will uh, effective, uh, create an effective behavior modification if there are so many intervening factors and people are just asking for money? Um, you know, how exactly is he going to divvy up, oh, pharmacy companies will have to pay this much or create anything meaningful that people can take in the future if, you know, there are so many factors that we can't understand? Yeah, um, so state, even though the state attorneys general are actually not part of the MDL, I'm going to reference them here because it's um, a blueprint we've seen in the past. So a lot of times state attorneys general, and I work for one and I think they do wonderful work, but a lot of times state attorneys general get involved in high profile public issues and they're looking for sort of settlement, headlines, and modification. Often the solutions that come up are not actually that useful and I think that's the concern here. So we might you know, Purdue may already be trying to preempt some of the things that the judge might be telling him. They're not going to be marketing directly to doctors anymore. They probably will be ordered to pay some amount of money to the various states to help with addiction funding, right? Maybe the judge can't order every state to have a prescription drug monitoring database. They already have a prescription drug monitoring database. He might have different modifications um, related to the obligations of pharmacies to check their files. Um, but it's actually um, hugely problematic. I mean, coming over here, I was trying to think about what would happen when I got this question. And it's been vexing throughout the process of writing about litigation to see virtually nothing 
asked for uh, by way of specifics. One example, Massachusetts Attorney General recently settled with CVS for a very small amount. I think it was something like $750,000. Okay, so that's a really low number. And it also sort of raises the concerns of those who are concerned that all this is going to wind up with giving attorneys a lot of money and not actually giving enough money to solve the crisis. But as part of that, the behavior modification was requiring CVS to develop a better drug monitoring database. So I think it's very likely that we're going to see those kinds of things, uh, requirements that companies create mechanisms to track um, high numbers of trafficking prescriptions. In many cases, that may already be underway. Uh, and, so, and so it's problematic. I think that most public health experts at this point think that getting the money to addiction centers and treating the public health situation is probably the crux of the problem and something that has to be addressed. So it may be that money in the end. Thank you for a great presentation. This is not an easy question. Could this all have been prevented? And this is important because, no, it's not a too late for to address questions since this is an ongoing crisis. And since a lot of people have been exposed or offered, even by the physicians, painkillers, and they said no. Uh, so there are still people who are exposed to it. Which ones are going to say yes and which ones are going to say no? And besides this, uh, the opioid crisis doesn't go on everywhere. So again, can this be prevented? So could this have been prevented from the start? So. Obviously, it's, it's hard to go back in history and look at some things, but what I sort of tried to describe today was a uh, dovetailing list of circumstances that produced this perfect storm. Look, if we had a better health insurance system where more kinds of services were covered, where doctors didn't have to result immediately to medication, instead of uh, behavioral interventions, therapy, uh, physical therapy to resolve pain, we would not have to rely on opioids nearly as much, right? So that's one piece of it. Um, if it turns out to be true that the pharmaceutical companies had a plan to aggressively and uh, inaccurately convey the non-addictive properties of their drugs, that's something that is fraudulent and, should have been, and, should, and could have been prevented. Um, if doctors had been trained in medical school about these issues and if the level of awareness about the dangers of prescription opioids was as high as it is now, fewer doctors would be prescribing back then, right? So there are all these different things that came together to contribute to this crisis. Um, that it's hard to go back and isolate just one of them, but it seems like any number of them would have contributed. I have two questions. Um, the first one is I personally have known three families that have had 25 to 28 year old children pass away from, uh, you know, heroin addiction. So how does this address that? It doesn't seem to me like it does because of all the, the three children that I know, they all started in high school with pills in high school. They yeah. went from pills to marijuana, right. to cocaine, to um, heroin. Right. That's question one. Question two is, i uh, from New Jersey and I go to the Jersey Shore and now New Jersey is thinking of uh, you know, legalizing marijuana. Right. And many of the shore communities are, uh, I guess they have one year from the enactment of the law in New Jersey to pass their own uh, town law prohibiting marijuana shops in their shore towns. And they are doing that from what I'm reading. They don't want marijuana shops, head shops next to the Music Man ice cream shop right. in Lavalette, New Jersey because they're trying to have their children not uh, see drugs or glorify drugs, and they're trying to keep their kids away from drug drugs, and they're taking them to ice cream shops, and they don't want to see these drug shops. So how does all this fit with this legalization of marijuana for families? Okay, these are wonderful questions. So uh, the movement across the various states to legalize marijuana has been going on for years before the opioid crisis, so it's not directly tied into it. I will say, and I received this question earlier today, that there are studies that are starting to come out that are arguing that legalization of marijuana could actually help a crisis of this nature by giving easier access to drugs that are less dangerous. But marijuana is much less dangerous than an opioid laced with fentanyl. Now, as I said in my remarks, that's a controversial argument and one that a lot of people are uncomfortable with, and I myself have not gotten to the point that I'm comfortable with it. But um, 
It's an argument that this is, goes to the idea of treating drug use as a public health problem to be regulated, to make it as safe as it possible, and rather than to adopt the fiction, what some people believe is a fiction, that you can stop drug use entirely. So if most, the most dangerous drugs are the ones that are cheap and accessible to kids. Their argument is provide a different kind of drug. That's the argument. I'm not saying that's my argument, but that's the argument. Now let me go back to your heroin question, and I'm, I'm very, very sorry about your friends. Um, you know, one of the worst things about teaching this course, I have three little children, and in teaching this course to hear the number of children that have been affected by this is horrifying. And the very first thing that I did is go home to my kids and say, do not take a pill. Like, smoke a cigarette, have a beer, do not take a pill, even though it seems like it's not a dangerous thing to do, right? Um, so there are studies that show that, as you yourself mentioned, kids start in high school with whatever they can find in their parents' cabinet, Oxy, Xanax, whatever. It's easy, it's light, it's fun. It's a gateway, right? And kids get addicted, and they start going to the street for cheaper more effective highs. So there has been studies showing that the, the access to these, these pills, the diversion of pills from people who were validly prescribed them, um, opens the door to a heroin problem. And so that's the best answer I can give to that problem. So, but that is how it ties into it. So arguably, if fewer of these drugs have been uh, pr prescribed, if fewer of them were in our cabinets, if fewer of them were sort of laying around, our parents have been safer with their drugs, we might not have as many kids, um, or more awareness had been uh, pushed there might not be as many kids who would have tried these drugs and then led to the heroin problem. But that's the argument that's been made. Okay. Thank you so much for a wonderful presentation. Um, I was curious if you've seen an uptick in a push for more drug courts. I know it's very controversial as to whether we treat criminals or we lock them up, and there's quite a bit of research and positives that have been developed through um, the drug court system. Yeah, so in the course of our seminar, we actually had people presenting evidence on both sides for drug courts. Uh, there was one argument that rural uh, users are, are uh, discriminated against because there are so few drug courts that are nearly accessible to them, and that drug courts also can order medication-assisted treatment, so those who don't live near drug courts actually suffer a harm. There are others who are arguing with different data that drug courts have actually not been very effective, and so I can't give an answer on that problem. I will give a related um, make a related point because I, I think it relates to this idea of, of, of using courts in this way. Um, there are a number of states that now have civil commitment laws on the books which allow people to uh, involuntarily commit an addicted person to treatment for their own safety or for the safety of others. However, I just want to point out that these laws are largely problematic for two reasons. One is that the standard of commitment is much lower than the standard used by the medical profession to commit someone involuntarily. But two, and perhaps more importantly, many of the institutions to which people are civilly committed do not offer medication-assisted treatment. Right? So they're, civil, they're civilly committing persons for their own safety, for detoxification. That doesn't meet the standard of care. I know I'm really hammering home this medication assistant treatment, and one of the reasons I am is that over the course of the last five months that we've been doing this at Yale, the one theme that has emerged is this, how important it is. And the one place where many of us started in the seminar was thinking this was not that important. Give people drugs, secure them from drugs. We had criminal law people in our seminar who thought this was the wackiest idea they'd ever heard in the beginning of the course. And now having been through this and been presented with the evidence and gone through all these studies, I think it's become apparent to all of us who are working in the court this is actually an extremely important uh, treatment. And to civilly commit someone without giving them the proper treatment makes absolutely no sense. And it, it, it's part of um, what's baffling uh, about the crisis. Not direct answer to your question, but the closest I can offer. To what extent? To what extent is that on? I'm not sure. To what extent is the uh, influx of black market fentanyl from China due to lax enforcement of uh, drug laws in China, and what, if anything, is being done or could be done about that? Right, so that I cannot answer. Um, Case that's on my faculty has an article coming out in our journal that's about the dark web of um, trafficking in fentanyl. Um, from that piece, what I know is that it's been extremely hard. It's very slippery, extremely hard for DEA to track these packages. There are high-level efforts to stop them, but it's, it's, apparently it's very, very difficult. And I don't specialize in criminal law, so it's not my area, which I feel like I speak intelligently.
We have time for a couple more questions if there's a hand. Well, I'm, I might, while we're, since we do have a few minutes left, I might ask you a question myself, which is, um, I guess kind of ties into one of the questions that came from the back there about the narrative about, you know, th that a lot of these cases arise from teens and high school students, um, you know, getting drugs at school, at home, and so on. Um, I mean, how much is the, wh whereas the lawsuits you've talked about have very much focused on the doctors and the sort of pharmaceutical and medical chain, and I feel like there really has been this narrative about um, the opioid crisis starting because of um, you know, medical, legitimate medical prescriptions that turn into addictions. And I think there's been more recent data, if I'm not mistaken, suggesting that that is actually a very small percentage of um, how, uh, of cases of opioid addiction, of how they arise. So I wonder if you have seen data um, on that either way as well, and what you make of this sort of desire to medicalize this story, I guess. Yeah, you know, sort of as I was speaking, I was thinking, okay, if there are doctors in the room, they're going to think that I'm sort of anti-doctor, which I'm not. You know, I am a health law professor, I love doctors, and I, uh, <laughs> part of presenting that story is actually to be able to present the counter-argument about the uh, dramatic deviation from the norm of medical autonomy that this kind of overregulation of doctors has um, contributed to. Um, however, I think earlier in the crisis there were statistics about the diversion of prescription drugs um, to, to young people as being this gateway to other more illicit drugs. So I think, number one, that was part of it. There are also many people who are part of this crisis that actually began on prescription drugs. So the longer a person is on a chronic drug with each passing day, the more likely it is you can suffer addiction. So there are a portion of people uh, who are given chronic drugs for back pain or other conditions that took them for a while and developed addiction. So I think it's a combination. I, I, I don't think that the situation is that um, prescribing <coughs> had little role to play. I think right now we're in a moment where it's not the prescribing anymore. That's the problem. It's the epidemic that's come out of that. And so in some ways, all these efforts to regulate the medical community, they're almost too little too late. But at the same time, um, the awareness that they've heightened has obviously changed behavior even probably without um, the legislation. Oh. oh, goodness. Okay. <laughs> One question in the back. Hi. Hi. Um, this is kind of a basic question, but I was just wondering what kind of claims people are bringing in the great. pollster cases. Yeah, it's a great question. So, um, first, our claims about fraud, right? That the pharmaceutical companies committed fraud. They lied when they represented their drugs were safe. There are also a huge number of state statutes. These are really the most effective claims, the easiest claims. They're sort of consumer protection statutes, um, and they are statutes that involve Medicaid fraud, right? So states are being, uh, we, we overpaid for these drugs that were promoted and weren't worthwhile. Our consumers were defrauded, lied to, misled into thinking these drugs were okay. There are some claims that are based on a doctrine called public nuisance which is that people create a public health or safety pro problem in a jurisdiction. There are some racketeering claims, right, conspiracy uh, to commit fraud. Those are the vast majority of the claims. Then there are these Controlled Substances Act derived claims that basically say there was a right under federal law that you violated and therefore in the state some aspect of state law gives rise to a cause of action. So there are many different areas of state law that will say, for instance, if someone commits a violation of a federal statute, you might have a cause of action under the state law of X, right? So that's the way those claims are going. There are also many, de many Controlled Substances Act type acts in different states that parallel that Controlled Substances Act regulation um, that put duties on individual uh, distributors and those who interact with controlled substances, and people are suing under that as well. Hi. Oh, that's, oh, yikes, that's a lot of pressure. Um, I, I, and I'm not exactly sure what I'm even asking in this question, but um, so historically, drug laws have followed immigration patterns, right? So we've, you know, the Harrison Act was in response to Mexican immigration, and opium was in response to Chinese immigration, and, um, and uh, so many fears around, like, the crack epidemic were intimately related to, like, white, our white, white people's fears of black people. Um, and this is the first time, in my understanding, of drug uh, like history in the U.S. is it's not connected. You know, it can't it can't be um, misappropriated in the way that drugs have be have been in the past and has have kind of been used as a tool to decide who we don't want in our communities. 
Um, and with this, with the opioid crisis not being tied to immigration, I feel like that has a, a potential impact on the, the conversation. And I just want to be clear, like, I don't think that the, that the drug laws were accurately responding to real threats. They were used as th fake threats to kind of drum up these laws. And so just thinking about how the history of drug laws relates so much to kind of our history of racism in the country and then in this current moment, just what are your thoughts on Yeah, on that? this is a point that I was uh, trying to get at, although maybe I hadn't been clear and earlier, which is the idea that this crisis, it does not have that narrative and this crisis has produced a aggressive, highly resourced state legislative response. You have general sessions creating a, a task force. You have this being treated as a public health problem. I'm talking about the Eighth Amendment, right? Cool, unusual punishment in prison. All of these things, this kind of response, is viewed by many as precisely evidence of the kind of discrimination that undergirded the earlier drug laws, right? The stigma and the criminalization that incurred, undergirded those early epidemics precisely because of which communities were predominantly affected. This is why there are uh, many black physicians who are engaged in this crisis who are outraged, right? They're happy to see the treatment of addiction as a public health crisis, but they're also outraged at, the, at how much it highlights the different way in which predominantly black drug epidemics have been treated in the past. So um, to the extent there's anything beneficial that comes out of it, it sheds light on that history, um, but it doesn't explain in a coherent way um, why this epidemic is being treated differently. The only thing I would say that, um, that, 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 that undercuts what I just said and gives a plausible explanation is that brain science has developed uh, in the last several years. So there is now a broader, and this may also be in part because of the attention that was focused on this very epidemic, so it's a chicken and egg problem, but there is actually a, a growing recognition across all different aspects of actors in the system that addiction is not a crime or a choice or a thrill, but it is a disease of the brain, and once the proper switches are turned on in the brain, uh, People are irrational, and they'll make decisions that are harmful, and you can't just say, don't do it anymore. You have to treat it as a public health problem. So to the extent that has developed, it has changed the nature of the response and, in fact, gives rise to arguments about, say, providing that in prison, because that's the only rational solution. You can't just tell someone, stop doing drugs. Wonderful. Well, um, on that note, please join me in thanking our, our wonderful speaker once again. There is a reception out in the rotunda for those of you who can join us.